The Boy Who Drew Birds A story of John James Audubon by Jacqueline Davies Illustrated by Melissa Sweet To my mother, Ann Davies, J.D. To Sally Regan, M.S. It was true that John James could skate, hunt, and ride better than most boys. True also that he could dance the minuet and gavotte as if he had been born a king. He could fiddle, he could flirt, he could fence, but what he liked to do best, from sunup to sundown, was watch birds. John James's happiest memories were of woodland walks with his father near their home in France. On these walks, Papa Audubon would talk of birds their beautiful colors, their graceful flight, and, most wonderful of all, their mysterious disappearance each fall, followed by their faithful return in the spring. on the banks of a creek. His father had sent him there to learn English, to learn commerce, to learn how to make money in America. But mostly he had sent his only son away so that John James would not have to fight in Napoleon's war. John James wondered if he would ever see his father again. It was April in Pennsylvania, and slashes of snow still lay in deep hollows. John James splashed across the icy creek. He scrambled up the bank and approached the limestone cave, wondering what he would find today. Just the empty nest of a peewee bird, as he had found the last five days? Or would there be... of John James's head and snapped his beak. Clack, clack, clack. John James ran out of John James ran home through the woods. Madame Thomas, Madame Thomas, he shouted, bursting into the farmhouse kitchen. Il y a des oiseaux. In his excitement, his words tumbled out in French. Mrs. Thomas was the housekeeper Papa Audubon had hired to take care of Mill Grove, his American farmhouse. She pointed her long wooden spoon at John James's muddy shoes. He quickly took them off and placed them by the fire to dry. Birds, he said. I see birds, too, in cave. Beautiful. Mrs. Thomas frowned. She was fond of this energetic French boy, and yet she had to admit that he was something of a cracked pot. Birds. Always birds. From the moment he woke up in the morning to the moment he closed his eyes at night, he thought only of birds. It was strange for a boy his age. Master Audubon, 
she scolded. Thou wouldst do well to do God's work by tending the farm more and chasing after birds less. But John James, halfway up the staircase, pretended not to hear. He climbed straight to his attic room, his musée, he called it. Every shelf, every tabletop, every spare inch of floor was covered with nests and eggs and tree branches and pebbles and lichen and feathers and stuffed birds, red wings and grackles, kingfishers and woodpeckers. The walls were covered with pencil and crayon drawings of birds, all signed J.J.A. Every year on his birthday, John James took down these drawings, a year's worth of work, and burned them in the fireplace. He hoped some day he would make drawings worth keeping. Each spring, the scientists who wrote these books did not agree. Each one gave a different answer. 2,000 years before, the Greek philosopher Aristotle had given his answers to these questions. Aristotle said that every fall, great flocks of cranes flew south and returned in the spring. But he believed that small birds did not migrate. Small birds, wrote Aristotle, hibernated under water or in hollow logs all winter. Many scientists of the day still agreed with Aristotle. Small birds, they said, gathered themselves in a great ball, clinging beak to beak, wing to wing, and foot to foot, and lay under water all winter, frozen-like. Fishermen even told stories of catching such tangles of birds in their nets. John James had never, ever, found a tangled ball of birds under water, and he did not believe everything the scientists said. Why, some of them believed that birds transformed from one kind into another each winter, and one scientist claimed that birds traveled to the moon each fall and returned in the spring. He said the trip took 60 days. John James had never spent much time inside a classroom, and he had failed every exam he had taken in school. But he considered himself a naturalist. He studied birds in nature to learn their habits and behaviors. I will bring my books to the cave, John James decided, and my pencils and paper. I will even bring my flute. I will study my cave birds every day. I will draw them just as they are. And because he was a boy who loved the out of doors more than the inn, well, that is just what he did. In a week, the birds were used to him. nest had become a soft green bed, and John James had learned to imitate the throaty call of the birds. Phoebe, Phoebe. Spring slipped into summer. Summer sighed and became fall. John James watched as two broods of nestlings hatched. He watched as the young birds flew for the first time. He began to feel a part of this small family. When the drays grew shorter and the autumn air began to bite, John James knew the birds would leave soon. But would they come back? He had to know. The question was terribly important to the boy so far.
falcon could be returned. Why not band a wild bird to find out where it goes? It had never been done, but John James could try. He pulled a string from his pocket and tied it loosely around the baby bird's leg. The bird pecked it off. The next day, he tried another string to the bird's leg. Again, the bird pecked it off. Finally, John James walked five miles to the nearest village and bought some thread woven of fine strands of silver. This thread was soft and strong. He tied a piece of it loosely to one leg of each baby bird. A week later, the birds were gone. All winter, John James worked in his musée, painting the pencil sketches he had made in the cave. He hoped that on his next birthday, he would have one or two pictures worth saving from the fire. The creek was frozen now, and each time John James skated past the empty cave, he thought of the 2,000-year-old question. Where do small birds go, and do they return to the same nest in the spring? The days grew longer. The ice on the creek cracked and melted. One morning, John James heard a loud bird call. He ran to the and snap his beak. Instead, they ignored John James as if he were an old stump. Watching the birds fly in and out of the cave, John James knew that his friends had returned. But where were last year's babies now grown? Had they returned too? He began to search the woods and orchard nearby listening for their call. Out in the meadow, inside a hay shed, he found two birds building a nest. One wore a silver thread around its leg. Up the creek under a bridge, he found two more nesting birds, and one wore a silver thread around its leg. John James wanted he ran back to his house to gather his pencils, paper, and flute. As he ran, he called, Phoebe! Phoebe! about John James Audubon. Banding a bird, that is tying a marker around a bird's leg to track its movements, was an innovative idea in Audubon's time. In fact, in 1804, John James became the first person in North America to band a bird. His simple experiment helped prove a complex theory. Many birds return to the same nest year after year, and their offspring nest nearby. This behavior is called homing. The rest of the world learned of Audubon's experiment when he wrote about it in his book, Ornithological Biography. Later, in the 20th century, scientists used bird banding to prove that small... his father. The young John James grew to be the greatest painter of birds of all time. 
he was the first to paint life-size images of birds and the first to show birds hunting, preening, fighting, and flying. His revolutionary paintings pleased two audiences, scientists who were drawn to their accuracy and ordinary people who simply enjoyed the beauty of his birds.